yes i, I will tell you that i am ready so so uh, today as well this talk with, with without talk or uh, uh yes i i think I, i think i am now ready to be with you so okay all right yes uh, I, i think i am with you now yes yes so okay. uh, all right thank you very much yes so once again to welcoming you in the last session of this second day of the refresher course okay. and thank professor you. ss uh, kulsesta would be uh, talking on the uh, from classical to the quantum gravity and where he left uh, last evening mm -hmm. so you have one hour 15 minutes and within that uh, we will having the discussion and a question so and uh, the participants also requested that the today is the uh, hindi divas so they want to celebrate some way as well mm -hmm. they want to spare some time for that way as well mm -hmm. so now over to you sir now you can start okay okay thank you nandan ji thank you so much for your very very kind words thank you and uh, i'm equally happy to be back with all of you once again and i i think you thank just you. asked me if it is going to be uh, so uh, the talk and chalk method without a chalk so yes uh, it's going to be a talk and chalk method but minus the chalk so Uh, only talk <laughs> so and also uh, i would have uh, nothing to say here uh, i am in the traditional slides and so on uh, except to share myself and to share my views with you uh, i hope uh, it goes fine with my with your colleagues and the audience so with that uh, i i think we could already take off now on the topic of my talk today so uh, we have chosen it to be from classical to quantum gravity and as usual uh, i would uh, Mm, uh, okay so uh, dr nandan west is uh, everything looks fine with you on my side yes sir yes sir everything is uh, yes sir fine. okay 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 so well the topic of the today's talk as you have just said is going to be from classical gravity to quantum gravity or from classical to quantum gravity so this is a very deep and very vast and very old subject and one of the best known subjects but you see there are always many many new things to learn and many new ways actually to think of uh, uh, you every day you don't get many new things but you get some new interpretations new ways of understanding the same same thing that we have known for a long time so uh, today instead of uh, 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 be uh, thinking of the landing on moon let us think of the big bang so you see our our universe was born something like 13.7 billion years ago and all the fundamental laws of nature were also born right at that time and it's our privilege we are happy and lucky that we are trying to understand this fundamental laws of nature and you always have many new things to understand with them so uh, for that this uh, history of our evolution is not really too long and it may still ta take a lo lot of time but each generation uh, uh, in their times they always discover many new things and many new ways of thinking so you see uh, it reminds us of the so called big bang uh, big bang experiment 
not the experiment. I mean, the Big Bang, the nature performed this experiment some 13.7 billion years ago, and the universe came into existence as it is um, believed and thought. So the fundamental laws of nature were also born at that time. And we have two fundamental theories at our hand today. One of them is the quantum theory, and one of them is general relativity, which is a classical theory of gravity classic, based on classical field theory in the curved space-time manifolds. We will try to unfold the mysteries of this uh, vast and uh, difficult subject. So, you see, in in uh, quantum theory describes the laws of microcosmos. It describes the physics of the universe inside the atom as uh, put in the words of Mr. Adhoop. And general relativity describes the laws of cosmos, physics of the large distances, physics at the large distances, physics of the universe, physics of the solar system, physics of the black holes, physics of the wormholes, physics of time travel and what and what not. So, quantum theory is based on one very beautiful idea that you can create energy out of vacuum, which is not empty, but is a boiling soup of elementary particles being created and destroyed. And uh, always the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator is the best example, or you can then start taking, talking about a scalar field, quantization of a scalar field, vector field, and spinner field. So you have some annihilation and creation operators of that theory, and you operate on the vacuum state with the creation operators successively, and you keep increasing the energy uh, by each time you operate on it with one uh, creation operator, you increase the energy of the, the eigenvalue of this system by one unit of quantum energy, h cross omega. And that is what is meant by creating energy uh, out of vacuum, the, the main feature of quantum theory. And in, in special relativity, we have the equivalence of mass and energy. And these, these two things, these two things have to be, uh, these two things have to be uh, married. They, 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 their marriage produces beautiful results called as the quantum field theory which describes the quantization of the electromagnetic field, quantization of the uh, strong interaction, strong field, quantization of the weak interaction, weak nuclear decay, and so these three fundamental forces of nature, but not gravity. So we always keep in our mind this point that this, and you see the quantum theory as well as general relativity, both of them have been experimentally verified up to several digits, you see. So quantum theory can eventually be summarized into the so-called standard model of particle physics, where one talks about all the quantization of these three fundamental forces of nature. And you see the current status of the contents of this standard model are, we have with us six quarks, up, down, strange, charm, beauty, and top. And we have six leptons with us, electron, muon, and tau, meson. And the three corresponding neutrinos, electronic neutrino, muonic neutrino, and tauonic neutrino. And then we have uh, the vector gauge bosons, which are the mediators of the force. So. Uh, Photon is the mediator of electromagnetic interactions. Eight gluons, they are the mediators of the strong force. So quarks talk to each other. Electron, pro, electron, positron, they talk to each other via the exchange of uh, photons in electromagnetic interactions. 
in strong interactions quarks talk to each other via the exchange of the gluons and then w plus w minus and g0 are the fundamental gauge bosons of the electroweak theory so uh, 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 and of course on the top of this uh, you always have one uh, scalar higgs boson uh, the famous god particle of standard model as the the media likes to call it it was given by some physicist letterman or something i forget the name all the time anyway so uh, we know that this is the unique higgs scalar of a standard model and today's talk in the today's talk we will end up with the supergravity theory we will be where i will tell you that n equal to 8 supergravity theory will have 70 unique higgs scalars analogous to one higgs scalar of the standard model and gradually i would tell you how do we do it i am going to do it without any slides without any just a method of conversation with you people now so now what about general relativity general relativity for the theory of classical theory of gravity so let me first explain that uh, The, when i talk about general relativity which is the classical theory of gravity correct uh, theory of gravity uh, let me first distinguish that this is the einstein gravity and not the newton's gravity that i am talking about but what is the basic difference in these two in the newton's gravity i have two masses m1 m2 separated by a distance r1 so the force between them would be f1 would be m1 m2 by r1 square now i i i increase the distance from r1 to r2 increase or decrease i change r1 to r2 then the force f2 would be given by m1 m2 by r2 square now mr einstein mr newton tells us that this change of force from f1 to f2 is instantaneous without any loss of time and this is the newtonian gravity and uh, this happens to be incorrect so mr einstein tells us no you see nothing can move faster than light not even the gravitational signal which we will eventually discover that it's going to be called as a graviton so graviton is also not allowed to move faster than light so the force f1 will change to f2 in a finite non zero amount of time not zero amount of time so it's not instantaneous but it takes some time some non zero time whatever uh, given by the speed of light or by the some universal speed uh, which is the maximum attainable speed in nature so this we keep in mind so whenever we are talking about classical gravity this is always einstein's gravity Uh, it was it was developed at the hands of mr uh, david hilbert mr albert einstein marcel grossman many others many others uh, we will gradually continue on that so uh, in fact uh, david hilbert one of my idols in addition to mr paul dirac uh, david hilbert was uh, in my opinion the first person who wrote down einstein equations in the covariant form but anyway it's a just a matter of history for us now uh, einstein was no less smart mm, if you if you visit i happen to visit prague uh, in summers when the before the covid times and i hope things will improve so uh, the near the venue of this conference where they organize in the city of charles university uh, technical charles university of prague uh, one can really just walk to the other side of the river and there is the you locate the house i did it it was very fascinating and inspiring here mr einstein lived around the year when general relativity was discovered he lived there for about 16 months time and he used to teach there at the city u and uh, so you go to the place where he used to teach in the library now it's a it's a kind of pilgrimage for the people they can discover the biggest uh, oldest library in prague and you can they will tell you the rooms where he used to lecture and so on 
you can go to Cafe Lub, not very far from there, where Mr. Einstein used to have coffee. So all these things, they were very inspiring, in particular if you think about the gravity theory and uh, general relativity, universe, Big Bang, and everything. So this is just uh, to inspire our, our friends. So now, uh, what happens here, general relativity is little bit different than the quantum theory. In quantum theory, now you have these big, big, huge experiments going on at LHC and other elsewhere. And the each and every finding of quantum theory, like quarks, different quarks, uh, a Nobel Prize goes to each and everything that they discover. And this is good. It's a, it's a huge thing, a huge success. Now, general relativity is a theory very unique theory which got experimentally verified 70 years before it was born. So the theory was born around 1915 and it got experimentally verified in 1845 at the hands of a French astronomer Mr. La Verrier. So Mr. La Verrier, he measured the advance of perihelion of Mercury to a great, great, great accuracy. So uh, it, the, the, the result was 43 arc seconds per century and if you calculate it using general relativity the result is just exactly the same. You see, so this is the power of the theory and this is the power of the experiment, you see. So now, uh, I mean the The theory got experimentally verified 70 years before its birth, and the, the theory came into existence around 1915. So this is the this is the power of the, our our thinkers. Now, uh, there are many many in the in the last one decade alone, there are many landmark events in this area. Uh, the, the, each one of them goes to towards the experimental verification of general relativity. Uh, let us just count a few. So the landmark thing. So gravitational wave detection at the LIGO uh, is, is all within less than 10 years, last one decade. So experimental detection of the gravitational waves uh, at LIGO, then construction of uh, the black hole image, construction of the black hole image uh, by the use of uh, so-called event horizon telescope. Event horizon telescope is an array consisting of eight telescopes that are spread around the globe, around our mother earth. And they also, it's a very, very beautiful construction. And there is a, there is a, distant galaxy from our Milky Way galaxy which is named as M87 and a supermassive black hole is sitting at the center of this galaxy M87 and this black hole image construction of the black hole image is that of this particular black hole sitting at the center of this galaxy M87. This supermassive black hole is almost six to seven billion times heavier than the, the mass of our uh, solar system, than the solar mass, which is, I mean, practically it's the mass of the sun. Other masses do not count when you compare it with the mass of the sun. And its spread is, I think, something like 40 billion kilometers across. So it's bigger in size, it's bigger than the size of our own universe. You see, this is what we are uh, talking about. And uh, about the advance of perihelion, before I uh, go to the next, uh, to cite you the next experimental super test of general relativity, uh, for the younger people, let me just remind one little thing, explanation or a corollary towards uh, what is advance of perihelion. So, for example, Earth takes 365 days in making one revolution around the sun. Now, 
and you, you know approximately an elliptical orbit so then sun our earth is nearest to the sun so let us say at one of these uh, points and sun is sitting at one of the four sides so the distance between earth and sun is minimum it happens once in a year and now earth goes on a journey of 365 days when it comes back to that point what happens that the major axis of this ellipse has got rotated slightly so it, it does not come back to the point where it is started but its position has got advanced this is called advance of perihelion in this case it would be the advance of perihelion of earth in the case of mercury mercury is a smaller planet and much closer to our earth its orbit is much shorter much smaller than the orbit of the earth it makes one revolution in about 88 days and moreover the or elliptical orbit is little more skewed more eccentric you see a circle would have eccentricity of uh, uh, 1 or 0 b square is a square okay so uh, literally anyway so in circle the measurement of the semi major and semi minor axis is identically the same and when the difference in these two grows the it becomes more eccentric so uh, the elliptical orbit around the sun of that of the mercury is much more and much nearer and much uh, lighter than earth so it makes about uh, one revolution in about 88 days so and each time so this guy french astronomer la verrier he measured the advance of perihelion of mercury per revolution then you could calculate it for the year then you could calculate it for the whole century so for one century advance of perihelion of mercury turns out to be 43 arc seconds experimentally as well as theoretically based on the general relativity so this is the accuracy of the uh, theory of relativity now let me take up a very recent uh, experimental which is called as super test of general relativity this is based on i mean in 19 no 2020 the nobel prize has gone to mr roger penroch uh, reinhard gensel and andreas gage andreas gage is the woman now penroch told us that yes Uh, similar to the galaxy distant galaxy m87 a supermassive black hole is also sitting at the center of our own milky way galaxy and the location of this particular supermassive black hole in our galaxy is named as sagittarius a star or sgr a star now this is a supermassive black hole so hundreds and thousands of objects revolve around this object and each one takes its shorter orbit bigger orbit takes its own time so the woman physicist andrea gage she chose a particular star called as s2 or so2 by both the names she chose this particular star which revolves around this supermassive black hole sitting at the location sagittarius a star and the period of revolution of this s2 star is approximately 16 years so she was being a brave person brave physicist brave soul she kept tracking the orbit of this star for 16 years to measure the advance of perihelion of this system of uh, this guy star s2 around this uh, location sagittarius a star and you see the the this could also be calculated theoretically you see so uh, our experimentalist and theorists we are blessed having both of them are very uh, very bright hard working intelligent people so the two results they again agree uh, perfectly well and so this is being this is being recognized by the by the physics nobel in 2020 and in fact this uh, andrea gage happens to be the fourth uh, woman physicist to win the nobel prize uh, with that i would not forget to mention my personal comment i am very unhappy that nobel prizes are being given since 1900 starting with mr max planck there are only four women physicists that have been recognized 
there have been many, many more. Uh, we need to change this. There are apparently a lot of women, great women physicists. But I'm happy for Andrea Gates. She has made a tremendous contribution, uh, giving us this super test of experimental test of general relativity. So now with that, I can perhaps move on. And uh, now we could try to, before, uh, I mean, there are many, many achievements of this general relativity, which explains black holes, wormholes, time travel, and everything. Let me take some formal aspects of this theory for my younger colleagues, for my younger friends. And this uh, takes me to takes me back to Mr. Pythagoras. Uh, I would like, as I said, that we are using a special relativity. Uh, I mean, this is a basic ingredient that you marry quantum mechanics with special relativity to obtain the so-called standard model. And now we are proceeding towards learning a little bit about general relativity. What is the difference in these two? In the mathematical formulation, I would explain it in few words. And I would start with Mr. Pythagoras. In the first place, uh, before I do that, uh, let me mention that there is something called as line element, ds square, which is some matrix tensor g mu nu times dx mu times dx nu. This matrix tensor g mu nu measures distances in the space-time manifold. This g mu nu could be a constant as it is a constant fixed in the in the in the standard model physics for all those those three interactions. And it is not constant in the gravitational theory. This is a function of x mu, the space-time coordinate. So this g mu nu is a field by itself. Now this statement of mine is too formal and sometimes it doesn't work so nicely with my with my new students and new colleagues who want to, everybody is curious, you see. This is a subject which interests everybody at every age. You see, irrespective of age, uh, you can, this can always fascinate you. So, <coughs> so this, now, let me go back to Mr. Pythagoras. <coughs> and let me generalize his theorem of Pythagoras theorem that we know. So what we do, let us take a plane, plane geometry, two-dimensional plane geometry. You consider a right angle triangle. You call one side as dx, one side as dy, and it's diagonal to be ds. So ds square is dx square plus dy square. Everybody would agree? So it's a two-dimensional geometry, plane geometry. Now, uh, you make a generalization to three dimensions, then ds square, the length, square for the diagonal is dx square plus dy square plus dz square. You could take an example of your own room where I am sitting for example or where you are sitting. Supposing it's a rectangular in shape, so you call these three x, y, z axis and but you have to choose it in such a manner that they form a right-handed coordinate system. Okay, So there is a difference in right-handed and left-handed. So choose the right-handed coordinate system. Now, ds square plus dx is dy square plus dz square is ds square. L now, let me extend it further. Let me introduce one more coordinate, w. So, then, and imagine, uh, I cannot uh, see it in, uh, in three-dimensional world, but just let us think. So, the ds square would be dx square plus dy square plus dz square plus dw square. Now, let me put W equal to iota times C times T. So, DW would be iota times C times DT. And it's a square, iota is a square root of minus 1. So, DW square would be minus C square DT square. Now, when I do that, then I am in a four-dimensional Minkowski space. So, here these signatures of if I call dx square plus dy square plus dz square as vector dx square, so then this signs of dt square and vector dx square are, uh, they, they differ by a minus sign. This is called as the Minkowski space. And the coefficients of these terms, dt square, dx square, etc., etc., they are 1. So either plus 1 or minus 1. Okay? Now, 
so as long as you do this there is no gravity in your theory and this minkowski space this is a uh, here fourth dimension is time and c the speed of light is introduced for dimensional regions because c into t would become distance now now i go to one further generalization what i do is i introduce four things a b c d and i take them as coefficients of dt square dx square d by square dz square and i assume that these capital a b c d they are functions of x mu so for example t x y z or t r theta phi if you want to work in spherical polar coordinates gravity uh, people usually prefer to work with spherical spherical polar coordinates so ds square will be minus c square dt square plus dr square plus r square dt square plus r square sin square theta d phi square this is but plus minus it's a matter of choice you could choose the matrix tensor to be plus 1 minus 1 then you would have this term c square dt square would be positive and other three things will be negative now so as soon as i introduce a b c d coefficients and as functions of x what i have done is i have generalized the theory i have generalized my matrix tensor eta mu nu which were fixed coefficients plus 1 minus 1 to some quantities a b c d which are now functions of x mu so they are fields by themselves each one of them is a field by itself you see and then i am in the gravity theory so you see gravity theory is we are doing this is called as the riemannian space but in riemannian space with a lorentzian signature so the signatures or signs of dt square and dx square they differ by 1 minus sign so that is that is fine because riemannian geometry you can also do in in plane euclidean space uh, n dimensional euclidean space you can do it in uh, generalized riemannian space so uh, if you keep lorentzian signature so that there is a minus sign in the this is just for uh, for illustrating or uh, motivating my very very young friends who are not so familiar with what is general relativity now i think they would be able to visualize what is general relativity you see what happens uh, at the very first year level we talk about vector calculus stokes theorem gauss divergence everything but we are talking in a three dimensional euclidean space and not only that so the matrix tensor is just plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 and non diagonal terms are zero i could take non diagonal terms to be non zero but then my axes would not be orthogonal to each other but they would be oblique axes so then i do minkowski space i introduce time uh, uh, mr minkowski the polish physicist he, he did it and we, 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 we are too lucky that uh, we have and and of course mr mr uh, hendrik lorenz and mr henry poincare who gave us uh, the four runners of general relativity without that we couldn't achieve general relativity so they gave us the lorenz transformations and poincare transformations you see so from there you develop the principle of general covariance anything which is invariant under lorentz transformations uh, and if can we can be uh, can have so in in gravity it would be general coordinate transformation okay because g mu nu is a function of x mu so ds square is g mu nu times dx mu dx nu and principle of general covariance tells us that all the fundamental laws they have to be covariant and uh, so this this uh, the laws would be covariant and these transformations they would be invariant under the general coordinate transformations which vary from point to point in the space time manifold so what have we achieved in the in this process we have gone from flat space time or the fixed space time to a space time manifold which is defined in a curved space time now our space time manifold is curved because g mu nu of x mu for which i have taken chosen these four uh, particular components to be non zero uh, and they are diagonal and non diagonal ones i have taken to be zero so that the axes are 
normal to orthogonal to each other. That, that is also, it makes life simpler. And I could work, if I like for gravity theory, I could work with spherical polar coordinates along with this uh, dt square term so that it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, I'm working in a four dimensional Riemann space with a Lorentzian signature. Okay? Uh, I hope that I have uh, conveyed some of the basic points in this direction of some mathematical formulations which you usually uh, in popular talks people usually avoid them but I, I love them so I like to tell my students uh, how I introduce my new students into the field this is the way uh, to my opinion and now I think we have gone that and now we have seen the successes of the general relativity that it's verified to several digits. So now I think uh, uh, we have to go a little bit further. So I think we have considered enough and talked enough about the so-called classical theory of gravity, which is the general relativity or theory of general relativity as it is called by both the names. Now, uh, so then I should start counting some, some shortcomings and the limitations where it fails or where it breaks down. I wouldn't, I, I don't like the word fail, so I like to say breakdown. Now, let me first remind myself of my basic uh, natural experiment, the Big Bang, the, the phenomenon of Big Bang. So you run the universe backwards in time for 13.7 billion years and you hit upon a singularity called as the Big Bang. Now, shortly prior to that, shortly before that, you see, so general relativity works extremely well, perfectly well, up to a short while before hitting the Big Bang. Because Big Bang is going to be a huge singularity, you see, and general relativity breaks down a little bit before that. When we reach the Planckian scales of energy, time, and uh, uh, distance, so 10 to the power minus 33 Planckian, distance 10 to the power minus 33 centimeters, 10 to the power 19 GeV, the Planckian mass, and 10 to the power something like minus 43 or minus 44 seconds, the Planckian time, you see. So, uh, shortly after the universe takes off at the Big Bang, uh, and after we arrive at the Planckian scales, then we can start describing our universe in terms of the general relativity. But if you want to go behind, further, running backwards in time, running like a running your movie backwards in time, then you hit upon that singularity. So, uh, so there is a question of singularities, and these singularities are very important. They, they are there, like the black holes, you see, the, uh, the existence of black holes. Now, uh, let me give a very short, very small example. Everybody knows about the escape velocity. So, escape velocity of a particle is the square root of 2mg by r square, now, let, let me concentrate and take an example of my own Earth. And I want to calculate. So, escape velocity for Earth, everybody knows, 11.2 or something uh, kilometer per second, etc., etc., whatever it is. Now, I want to keep the mass of Earth fixed and I want to keep reducing the radius r. Then what happens, as you reduce the radius r, the escape velocity increases and you keep doing it then what will happen a time will a, you will reach the limit when the escape velocity would become identically equal to the speed of light or the maximum attainable some universal speed see so uh, from here i just take r to the other side so this r this is uh, 2 mc by c square now so this r actually happens to be the radius of the black hole. What happens? When I reduce the radius of my earth keeping the mass fixed, then my earth becomes a black hole at a time when this r becomes of the order of 8.43 millimeters, roughly 8 millimeters, 8.43 millimeters. Then my earth becomes a black hole because the escape velocity becomes equal to the velocity of light. 
Now, even if I throw a photon out from my Earth, it will fall back on Earth. It will not go out. So, black hole, by definition, is an object from where nothing can come out. Things can only go in, one direction. You see? So, and this you can consider for, 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 uh, for any other object. For our sun, this would be something like three kilometers, the, the Schwarzschild radius. So this particular radius where this escape velocity just becomes equal to the velocity of light is called as the Schwarzschild radius. So we talk about a imaginary unidirectional surface around this black hole which is called as the event horizon. So things can go inside the event horizon but not outside. Now general relativity works extremely well up to the event horizon. But you can't explain, general relativity cannot explain anything uh, inside the black hole. So when you go beyond the soft cell radius, you cannot uh, describe physics anymore, what happens inside the black hole. So now, uh, uh, let me leave it there. So then this becomes a reality that there are singularities like running the, uh, like a black hole and the black uh, big bang. And then there are many other things in black hole physics. I mean, the information paradox, like the information that made a black hole, uh, uh, black holes are also not eternal. They eventually decay away and they die away. So some thermal radiation is taking place, given by Mr. Stephen Hawking. So then the question arises, do we lose the information about what once formed a black hole? If that happens, then that would clash with the unitarity of quantum mechanics, so that is not allowed. So then one has to modify the laws of quantum mechanics to accommodate gravity. And so this, this is one, and string theory, for example, and supergravity theory, these are the theories that explain uh, sufficiently well the information paradox of uh, black holes. So now, let me proceed to construct the, uh, in about 20 minutes or so, let me proceed to, uh, to construct a theory of quantum gravity, which should hold, which would help us where general relativity breaks down. Then beyond that, you need something, some theory to explain us the nature. So uh, we recap again that a standard model physics is a gauge theory. It, is, it has local symmetry. Now I go step by step. I first introduce supersymmetry into my standard model. So I construct supersymmetry is a symmetry that rotates bosons into fermions and fermions into bosons. Now, <clears throat> in the process, I construct a supersymmetric standard model. Now, when I do that, then supersymmetric standard model loses the uh, gauge symmetry or the local symmetry. Now, it is a supersymmetric theory, but the supersymmetry is rigid or global. So the gauge parameter is not a function of x mu, it's not a field, but it's a constant. In fact, it's a constant Grassmann spinner. So super, but what you gain is that there is a super partner to each and every particle that you have in a standard model, supersymmetric quark, supersymmetric lepton, supersymmetric uh, uh, photon, gluons and so on. To each and every particle you have supersymmetric uh, version of supersymmetric partner for each particle. And now, and what happens in, in conventional field theory which describes a standard model, there are some divergences. And these divergences are taken care of in, through the process of so-called renormalization. And why do we have these divergences? Because there is a singularity at r equal to zero in the Coulomb law of force. And um, uh, Mr. Heisenberg comes to our rescue, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It smears out the singularity at r equal to zero existing in the Coulomb law of force. So, uh, and this is done through uh, a theory which is called as renormalization theory. At Delhi University, I teach it in my quantum field theory 2 uh, course. Uh, so it's based on the covariant perturbation theory. It's very, very successful, beautiful theory. And now, when you have supersymmetric standard model, then the, the divergences get reduced. They get minimized. 
like if you calculate self energy of a higgs in a standard model and in the supersymmetric standard model in supersymmetric standard model this you have two diagrams they cancel out each other but in the in the conventional standard model it is quadratically divergent so and moreover it's a global symmetry now let us see how do we construct quantum theories from the classical theories so think of the dirac lagrangian and in the dirac lagrangian massless part massless dirac fermions you replace the partial derivative del mu by the covariant derivative and you introduce a gauge field into your theory this gauge field and in the process you construct a qed theory quantum electrodynamic so when you introduce a gauge field through the covariant derivative you get the drag action plus an interaction term but then the gauge field is non dynamical so you introduce it kinetic energy term for the gauge field which is uh, minus 1 by 4 f mu f mu the standard maxwell lagrangian you add to it and that completes my qed theory quantum electrodynamics now i want to do the same thing in my uh, in my theory which i propose to construct for my quantum gravity so what do i do i start with my standard model i introduce supersymmetry i end up with a supersymmetric standard model i have achieved some something uh, di divergences have reduced little bit but not completely so uh, what i do and it does not have gravity none of these theories has gravity in it standard model doesn't have gravity supersymmetric standard model doesn't have gravity so i want to introduce gravity what do i do now i introduce local symmetry into my supersymmetric standard model and i follow the standard procedure this is actually missed due to mr neother ami neother she was a german woman physicist ami neother very famous so uh, you introduce it a gauge field into the theory through a so called super covariant derivative and this gauge field in this particular case is not going to be a vector but it's going to be a vector spinner or a spinner vector so this is a spin 3 half field and this is called as the gravitino field and this so this is uh, this is wonderful i have a i have new particle called gravitino which is a spin 3 half particle now uh, two things are needed my interaction term would not have uh, this the gauge field gravity no would not be uh, would not be dynamical so i have to introduce the kinetic energy for this gravity no field and this is being done in terms of rarita swinger action this was written down by mr rarita william rarita and mr julian swinger uh, i think in 1941 so 60 plus 20 80 years ago it was written down you see rarita swinger so you add the kinetic energy term for the gravity no field and of course your uh, graviton also is to be dynamical so you introduce or you source it through the so called hilbert einstein action so uh, r minus 2 lambda by some 16 pi g so you introduce the so you introduce kinetic energy term for the graviton kinetic energy term for the gravity no field and Uh, the new gauge field is a vector spinner or a spinner vector which is the gravity you know. now there is a further choice if i want to work with n equal to 1 super gravity n equal to 2 super gravity n equal to 4 super gravity n equal to 8 super gravity and at the end of 15 minutes i would tell you that n equal to 8 super gravity theory is the ideal theory which unifies all the four fundamental interactions of nature including gravity and uh, this uh, 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 the divergences are because nobody has yet fully calculated uh, some diagrams to all orders as i will see the number of contents of particles keep increasing you see as you go from standard model i mean as you go from one field theory to other to other so uh, the number of particles already doubled in the standard supersymmetric standard model now what happens so uh, here one thing we need to remember is that any supersymmetric field theory has to satisfy the super poincare algebra and you can construct the supercharges for the theory 
and uh, you have to define or identify or define like in my gravity theory i i assume that graviton is going to be my particle with helicity plus 2 and uh, i don't want to go beyond that otherwise i would have to introduce more supersymmetries into my theory the higher supersymmetry higher than 8 if you introduce then then uh, then you will end up postulating new particles with spin higher than plus 2 so I, I I am satisfied with my graviton with spin plus two. Now, if I introduce one super symmetry in my theory, then I have one super charge, and it annihilates my graviton state. So each time I annihilate my graviton state with a super charge, the helicity goes down by one half. Helicity I could just remind that there is a poly Lewanski vector in the supersymmetric field theories, and the square of this uh, vector W square is one of the Casimir operators of any supersymmetric field theory. And the other Casimir operator is capital P square, the uh, generator of the Lorentz transformations, generator of the Lorentz group. So a Casimir operator is an operator that commutes with the, the generator of the Lorentz transformations and that commutes with the generators of the Poincaré transformations. And eigenvalues of these operators are important for the construction of the a supersymmetric field theory. So uh, now this uh, poly lewanski vector happens to be proportional to the P mu, the uh, generator of the uh, Lorentz group. And so if you write down the time-like component and put the proportionality constant as lambda, then lambda turns out to be p dot j divided by p0, where p and j are uh, momentum, field momentum and angular momentum of the field divided by p0, the field energy. So now it is clear, so I have defined helicity. So if you operate with a, any state with one in my supergravity theory, with a supercharge, the helicity of the state goes down by one half. So in n equal to 1 supergravity theory, I would create 1 gravity now. If I construct n equal to 2 supergravity theory, what happens? I will have two supercharges. I can annihilate the graviton state once by one charge, second time by another charge, and third time by both the charges. So I would have now two gravity nodes and one photon. Because if you if you operate on this gravity node state once again with your a supercharge, you, you, the helicity goes down by one half. So it's a one half, a spin one half particle, which is photon-like particle. So you have one graviton, two gravity nodes, and one photon. This is, in fact, happens to be the dream theory of Mr. Albert Einstein. He wanted to unify gravity with electromagnetism. So n equal to two supergravity theory unifies gravity with electromagnetic interactions. And one can see already some remarkable improvements, like you calculate photon, photon going to photon, photon scattering uh, to the one loop diagrams, fourth order diagrams. Calculate all the possible diagrams in n equal to one supergravity theory and also in n equal to two supergravity theory. You find that the result, net result in n equal to one supergravity theory it is still divergent, but n equal to 2 supergravity theory gives you perfectly convergent results. The divergences cancel out each other. So, in fact, the divergences cancel out in the supergravity theory at the S matrix level in contrast to what happened in my conventional field theories where there was no gravity, standard model. So, the divergences cancel out and this theory is finite order by order in perturbation theory. We could sometime have other talks or you could look at my talks in my uh, YouTube channel. There is one very extended talk on supergravity theory. Uh, so you can, you can go into those details. So now what happens if I have a n equal to 8 supergravity theory? I have 8 supercharges. Now I annihilate my graviton state once with one charge, second time with another charge, third time with another charge. 
so i have eight possibilities to do that so i have end up having eight gravitinos so i have one graviton with spin plus 2 eight gravitinos with spin plus 3 half now two supercharges could also annihilate the state at the same time then three also could so you calculate the number of how many states you will have so it would be give turn out to be uh, 8c0 8c1 8c2 8c3 8c4 8c4 is 70 actually that is the number of scalar because so each time you operate on a graviton state with one um, one supercharge uh, the gra the helicity goes down by one half so plus 2 then plus 3 half then plus 1 then plus 1 half then zero so graviton gravitino then photon like vector particles with spin plus 1 then electron like particles fermions with spin plus 1 half then higgs boson higgs scalar type 70 scalars in your n equal to 8 super gravity theory and now you can continue to apply to realize why is it a complete theory you can go you apply your you have eight supercharges you see so uh, now you you apply 8c5 annihilate the graviton state with five supercharges at the same time okay and you can do it in 8c five times similarly you do it six uh, supercharges Uh, ask them to annihilate the graviton state. You will end up with eight C six, then eight C seven, then eight C eight. So eight C eight again turns out to be one. Eight C seven turns out to be eight. So that is the number of gravitons. So in this theory, you not only have one graviton with spin plus two, but you also have a graviton with spin minus two, or helicity minus two. You have eight gravitons with spin plus three half, but also eight gravitons with is spin minus 3 half then 28 vector particles having spin plus 1 then 28 vector particles with spin minus 1 you see vector particles are photons photon like objects you see w plus minus are also vector gauge bosons okay and uh, so then then uh, electron like particles with spin plus 1 half and then the same number 56 with spin minus 1 half So one eight one eight twenty eight fifty six and seventy. Then again fifty six twenty eight eight and one. You add up all these things. This number comes out to be two fifty six. Okay. So now the number of particle contents. And you see there are uh, uh, there are too many particles, and each one for coupling with something would have some coupling constants. Like you have electronic charge in your QED theory. there are coupling constants in all the theories i mean whenever you have a product of two or more than two fields at the same space time point you need to have some coupling constant which couples them which keeps them together you see this platform where you are sitting as the audience i am sitting as a speaker we are tied together there is a coupling constant okay our our uh, kumau university nanital Uh, with professor sanjay pant and other friends nandan bist and all other people they have given us this opportunity so they have coupled us together you see without coupling we, we don't sit together correct so you have too many coupling constants all these masses so mass and coupling parameters you see so you have a whole lot of new particle physics waiting for you in front of you so you can calculate quantum corrections in all super gravity uh, uh, feynman diagrams what happens is that these contributions are too tiny we need a smarter and a smarter experimentalists who can distinguish who can detect them for us you see uh, you have to try to to detect graviton graviton you have to try to discover gravitinos and other things you see so we need in more smarter experimentalists to do this non trivial highly non trivial job for us and you see all those things that you have known so far in your conventional field theory that is only a subset of this n equal to 8 super gravity theory i personally 
have the opinion that this n equal to super gravity theory is perhaps going to be the ideal theory of quantum gravity. So, as our aim of the talk was to go from classical to quantum gravity in a short journey uh, of about 75 minutes, I have brought you all the way up to the theory of quantum gravity. But one thing you need to remember that this is a quantum theory of gravity or a theory of quantum gravity of zero dimensional particles and fields. In general, you call string theory as the correct theory of quantum gravity, but that is a theory of quantum gravity of extended objects and not the elementary particles as, as it is. So, the only drawback of supergravity theory is still could be that Newton's law of gravitation is also singular at r equal to zero. And if some uh, in, in, in conventional field theory there were divergences because of the Coulomb law and here they are there because of the uh, Newton's, law of uh, Newton's law of gravity. Of course, in supergravity theory, we need to remember that the divergences cancel out each other at the S matrix level and the theory is finite order by order in perturbation theory and therefore it is a finite theory and it has predictive power and the predict predictions of this theory could be confronted with the experiments which we still need to devise in Groningen, one friend of mine, Professor Anupam Majumdar, he is conducting an, a tabletop experiment to discover experimentally the graviton. So perhaps one could think of also discovering gravitino. In that case, if you discover a gravitino in the lab, then you have discovered supersymmetry and supergravity and uh, a theory of quantum gravity. Now, uh, maybe I can take two, three minutes extra. Now, in order to take care of his singularity at r equal to zero in the Newton's law of gravitation, what is the cure? The cure is I have to modify my um, uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So delta x equal to h cross by delta p, I add one extra term plus alpha prime, which is the slope of the famous slope of the regi, regi, universal slope of the regi trajectory. You also know it in hadron physics times delta p by h cross. Here in my conventional field theory, delta x can go all the way up to zero delta p can go all the way up to infinity and that leads to divergences in, in the conventional field theory standard model. But those divergences are being taken care of by renormalization theory. Now in supergravity theory, these divergences occurring if they occur because of the gravitational singularity in the gravitational law of Mr. Newton, then the if you if you generalize the heisenberg uncertainty principle you have to pay the price that now you no longer deal with zero dimensional particles and fields but you you talk about extended objects in space time which are either open strings with two open ends or closed strings as loops they propagate it in an ambient ambient space time manifold and they they, they produce the bird seeds and they could be parameterized through some coordinates, let us say sigma and tau, and uh, space-time manifold in this case happens to be 26 dimensional for bosonic string theory and equal to 10 for super string theory where you also have fermions into your theory. And lot of achievements have already been done. Many, many uh, unresolved problems of black hole physics have been resolved by the string theory. And you see that when you obtain the spectrum of string theory or super string theory, in the first place, it is fully consistent with the spectrum that you obtain in your supergravity theory. So in supergravity theory, you obtain a, a host of uh, massless states, and they are a subset of all the findings of the super string theory. You have this uh, finite number of massless modes but in addition to that, you also have some massive modes in the, in the energy range of the Planckian energies, 10 to the power, my, 10 to the power plus 19 GeV. And the ground state of the uh, both open and closed string is a tachyon with imaginary mass or m square operator as negative. But first excited state of the bosonic string theory is a photon. And first excited state of a closed string is a graviton. And in principle, 
uh, when you go further to the superstring theory, uh, there is some Raymond sector and Nebusat sector. So the, the mass spectrum of the Raymond sector is space-time fermions, and the mass spectrum of the Nebusat bosonic sector is all space-time bosons. So this is a very very challenging thing. Now the real challenge lies before us is how do we confront with the experiments? It's uh, much simpler to do that, confront the experimental observational physics in supergravity theory, even though, but you, in principle, you do have uh, signals from your quantum corrections that you can calculate. If I have another talk, I can explain how to do that. So you can construct Feynman diagrams, you can calculate precisely what are the quantum corrections, but they turn out to be is too uh, tiny to be experimentally detected unless we have very, very smart experimentation techniques. Now in su super uh, string theory, you have all those results as a subset of the super string uh, mass spectrum of that theory. And uh, the price you have paid is you have gone to, to so higher dimension things, high, higher dimensional, uh, I mean, they can be compactified to a tiny scale of the order of 10 to the power minus 33 centimeters, the typical size of a string, uh, length is 10 to the power minus 33 centimeters. And so eventually the equations of motion have uh, physical solutions with four large flat, which is we live in a flat space time, you see, Minkowski four dimensional space. So you can deduce it from your, the compactification of extra dimensions in string theory and super string theory to make uh, contact with the observational physics. So let me just classify that if you go to energies of the order of Planckian range and higher energies, you need super string theory. But below the Planckian energies, super gravity theory is a perfectly fine theory and the two are consistent. Uh, you can, you can, uh, you can obtain meaningful reductions of the super string theory to obtain your supergravity theory, this is one thing, or you could put your superstring theory, supergravity theory, and extend the vertices. In vertices in string theory and superstring theory, they are spreaded in space time because of the uh, generalization of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But in zero dimensional particles and fields, the three lines meet at a point. So all the vertices in all the Feynman diagrams in the conventional particle physics as well as in the supergravity theory are zero dimensional. So they are zero dimensional vertices and it takes care of most of the divergences as I have given you some examples. And uh, nobody has as yet calculated any process uh, in n equal to eight supergravity theory. It's a very, very hard job. I told you how many number of particles I mean, along with mediators of force and this, uh, like gravity, you is and now a, a, um, a force carrier in the supergravity theory. You see, it's a, it's a, it's a gauge field, but it's fermionic and not spin one up, but spin three half fermion. So these are highly non-trivial things, and they need to be understood in the very first place before you embark upon the possibility of handling them, attacking them. But nevertheless these things are doable. I have full confidence in my younger generation. Some people would come up. Uh, somebody told me yesterday that the person had done uh, Bjorken and Drell volume one and two. So this is remarkable. I mean, there are people who can do it. Anybody can do it, in fact. And at any age, you can do it. Because in the first place, you need a driving force, some motivation. Why do you want to do it after all? Why not just go for fun, go for a walk and but because if you want to understand something, you have to provide some input. And this is the, the price that you hope, but, but the results, achievements are tremendous, you see. So uh, to, to, to my mind, uh, the theory of quantum gravity, I could summarize for zero dimensional and particle and particles and fields could be very well given in terms of a n equal to eight super gravity theory, where there are 256 fundamental particles and the gauge bosons and so on, all of them, I mean, including force carriers and the constituents of matter. And 
you have complete so you can think of i mean for a for a graviton you could generalize it to a super graviton some kind of a super graviton which has all these particle contents of n equal to 8 super gravity theory as different polarization states of that super particle so with spin plus 2 plus 3 half plus 1 plus 1 half 0 minus 1 half minus one minus three half and minus two so all these particles they could be considered as the different polarization states of a more uh, fundamental particle which you might call by any name let us just call it a super graviton for the time being uh, there is nothing in a name uh, so but and if you if you still don't want to take any chance with the singularity at r equal to 0 for due to gravitational interactions of mr newton you go one step further and go to string theory and super string theory so bosonic string and super super string includes bosons and fermions both you see without talking about fermions life is not complete you sit on a chair you you are we are all consisted of these fermions these are the matter particles quarks and leptons but now in n equal to 8 super gravity theory we have too many of these particles 256 of these particles so uh, uh, i i think i have overshot by uh, 9 to 10 minutes already and i look forward to further directions no, no, from the chairperson of the session and i mean i can go okay, on okay so you are um, You are very much on time, sir. You are very much on time, uh, so we can okay. take a couple of questions. Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah. Sure. 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 Thank you very much. And, uh, Thank you very much. Please, I welcome. Please, I welcome uh, the questions from my uh, from my friend. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yes, I am. Uh, sir, uh, you uh, talked about you know discovery of the supersymmetric particles uh, in some tabletop experiments. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, sir, we have this LHC. Running in in CERN, mm -hmm. so whether LHC can also discover supersymmetric particles? It's in principle it's possible. You see what happens that uh, graviton is the not gravity gravitino is not the only particle which tells you about super gravity. When you construct a supersymmetric standard model, there are a complete host. So the number of particles that you happen to new in a usual standard model, now that number becomes just double. Okay, so photon, photino, gluon, gluino, and so on. Quark, s quark, lepton, s lepton. You see all of them, just the double. And because this particle, you see how do we discover them? Actually, we discover them through various processes. So particles, you see, they are short-lived particles. They eventually decay into different modes, different channels, as as my certain colleagues would call them. So different channels, you see. And uh, so one has to be smart, you see. Uh, you have possibility of detecting them at different places in the in the in the ring of the collider at CERN, and uh, people look at different energies and so on. Uh, uh, it's not impossible, but I would have hopes. But uh, my 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 comment was more in the nature of uh, provoking my younger friends. that not everybody should keep uh, banking upon the cern experiment only because it's fine it's great it, it, the 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 cern experiment takes trillions billions and trillions of dollars you see and there is a host uh, big big team of i think thousands of scientists engineers technicians of all kinds you see so actually contribution uh, from everybody is welcome in any way so you can think of some possible channels where you because you can always look for the decay modes or the scattering uh, processes that involve supersymmetric particles right like like uh, you have pair creation for example in qvd theory electron positron pair so there are eight fundamental vertices in qvd theory uh, involving electron positron and a photon so four with the emission of a photon four with the emission of photon a four with the uh, Four with the absorption, four with the emission, and these uh, two electron positron. So out of that you construct all the uh, Feynman diagrams in the QVD theory. This is important. Uh, please do remember always look for some good literature 
and the, the, the standard textbooks on this subject, Lewis Ryder and Mandel and so, they're very good books. Try to calculate simple thing. I mean, you don't have to calculate. You at least, we should be aware of many things. I also don't calculate everything. But I need to be aware of what is going on. So then we can think of, so in any given theory, how do you construct the different processes? First, construct the fundamental vertex of that theory. How many fundamental vertices you have in a theory? How, what is the content of that theory? What is the content, particle content of that theory? Like when you talk about electronic theory, you automatically also talk about W plus, W minus, and G0. When you talk about QCD theory, you automatically have quarks and gluons into the picture. When you talk about standard model, all these three things are going to be there together. You see? So, but remember that supersymmetric standard model, I mean, just now one friend of our was, uh, who raised the question, uh, uh, it just came to my mind to remind that supersymmetric standard model does not have gravity in it. So I would not even look for a graviton and gravity you know, in this experiment because there is no gravity in the theory at all. But super, supersymmetry is still there. So supersymmetric partners of the conventional particles are there. So you have to look for the fundamental diagrams, fundamental vertices of the supersymmetric standard model. There is a complete exhaustive list you can construct, okay? Even you can construct by yourself. These days people also do these things on the, on the computer, smart younger generation, you see? So how many diagrams, what are the force carriers, what are the... So for any given, pick up one particular process, calculate all the possible Feynman diagrams, then apply the common sense that try to compare only those Feynman diagrams where contributions are going to be comparable. All right. If the contributions are not going to be comparable, then why should I compare? Like if I, if I, if I write, uh, let, let me just say, for the, for the simple illustration, a Compton scattering, a photon hitting an electron, okay, eventually again going to a photon and electron. So this is the lowest order, second order diagram in QED theory. If you construct using the fundamental Feynman diagram, you can construct higher order diagrams, but higher order diagram for each vertex, there is a coupling constant little e sitting. So here you have e into e, e square. If you have fourth order diagram, then there would be e to the power 4. e is already a very tiny object, you see. So e to the power 4 would be much more negligible than e square. Similarly, e to the power 6, but then, then there are procedures to sum them up. One of them is called as party approximants. Where, how can you sum up the higher order diagrams? So you have to look up at all these things, then look up at the possible, you, you should aim at difficult things, you should aim at non-trivial things, otherwise you cannot achieve anything in, in life, you see. Simple things can be done by anybody. So try to think of difficult things, try to attack difficult things. Now, so okay, why not? Uh, CERN is uh, already running LHC experiment, improving its energy range all the time, is spending a lot of uh, money and energy and so on, new techniques. But we need to consider fundamental diagrams of a given theory, let us say in the supersymmetric standard model. Just now I mentioned uh, self-energy of a Higgs boson. Self-energy of a Higgs boson in a standard model is just one Feynman diagram, okay, uh, with two external, external legs. In supersymmetric standard model, there are two diagrams because then you also have Higgsino and Bino. They also make uh, contribution. And these two diagrams, both of them, each one of them is quadratically divergent and the two cancel out each other, you see. So uh, think of some other processes, okay, where there can be some finite contributions. You see, wherever you have some external lacks in your Feynman diagrams, uh, think of, first think of simpler things, but you can handle and think of so think of possible Feynman diagrams and the processes which can be constructed and explained in terms of the simple things. Go to lowest order possibly, if possible. If it doesn't work, think of another process in the lowest order. If it still doesn't work, go to the next higher order, okay? And give some concrete ideas to the experimentalists. What should they look for? Just I, I put all my hopes in experiments and they would do it out of the blue, that's impossible. I need to go. So there are also theorists who work on the phenomenology of these interactions. What kind of possible diagrams? I mean, at, at certain theory group, this John Ellis is one of the great 
great guys who he has been to Delhi University and he gave us one but nice beautiful lecture so th there are many many I mean interesting people many many interesting ideas construct I, I, I will not be surprised if there is already some exhaustive list of Feynman diagram calculable and non can calculable in the standard more in the supersymmetric standard model and I have told you one thing further is one step further beyond that, including supergravity, and all the way up to n equal to eight supergravity. So n equal to one supergravity, n equal to two are by far, by any means are not complete theory. You I, you have a graviton and a gravity, you know, but only spin plus two and spin plus three are. Then you have in n equal to two one with graviton with spin plus two two gravity you know, with spin plus two and one photon with spin plus one. But in n equal to 8, you have all the possible things, all the way up to a graviton with a spin minus 2, all the 8 gravity nodes with a spin minus 3. So think of those things and try to think of those processes where one could find some doable signals. Right now, it may, it, it may not be opened in front of me. I have it somewhere on my, on my stuff. Uh, the process is because you see in n equal to I mean so if you have one gravity node or two gravity you have to not only think of these gravity nodes but how do they couple with other particles okay how do they couple and at each vertex a, a neutron's constant g would be sitting instead of little e remember this but so consider those processes where there is only one gravitational vertex but there can be more let, let us say e square so if I have uh, one, one electron coming out, then I could think of, let us say, uh, uh, electron emitting a photon and reabsorbing it, for example, or two electrons coming out and they annihilate each other into a photon, or two photons coming out. But so one gravitational, um, one gravitational uh, vertex and other, uh, if, you, if you choose some diagrams where there are two gravitational vertices, then you really cannot do anything because that would be a square of the Newton's constant. You see, so it's a much, 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 much tinier thing. Then we cannot go to experimental. They will say you are crazy. So think where you can do. And in supersymmetric standard model, there is no Newton's constant at all. There is no gravity at all. So it should be much simpler. And I would pin up my hopes on LHC. But you see, you cannot make any definite statements unless things uh, work out. And I, I'm not too good at the, or I'm not so much familiar with the phenomenology of these, these uh, uh, processes involving, involving within the supersymmetric standard model. But what you have said is a genuine thing. It could be handled. It must be attacked. But you need to look up at some doable, measurable processes. But I, th I think you can find plenty of them in supersymmetric standard model. But if you can give some definite <laughs> guides, guidelines to the experiment, I mean, of course, through your preprints and your reprints and your papers, you can, you, you don't have to really go to CERN to, to tell them your ideas. And nowadays, you have so much of media, so much of, you don't even depend too much on physical review D all the time. You can publish your ideas, your things, and uh, people can start taking it seriously, you see, and make some definite suggestions to the experimental fraternity, you see. I mean, uh, some of them are very familiar with some theoretical stuff, but if you tell them in the simple way, as my, uh, one of my idols, Mr. David Hilbert, I'm a great fan of David Hilbert and Paul Morris Dirac, these guys, uh, I mean, a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm somehow uh, uh, more a fan of, fan of these guys, much more than uh, I am for Mr. Einstein. So Mr. Hil Hilbert says that any of your complicated ideas or theories, you ought to be able to explain to a person whom you first meet on the street. He was a mathematician, okay, living in Göttingen, hundred years ago, 1920s, 30s, they were the, Göttingen was known as the city of noble laureates. You walk around on the streets, you find the houses of these noble laureates who lived there in Göttingen, you see. There was an the Academy of Sciences in Göttingen, which was always, they were competing with 
प्राग 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 एकेडमी ऑफ साइंस इज यू सी एंड दिस सो सो ट्राई टू नॉट ओनली इट इज नॉट इनफ टू थिंक ऑफ कॉम्प्लिकेटेड एंड आइडियाज थिंक ऑफ ड्यूएबल थिंग्स एंड यू ऑट टू बी एबल टू कम्युनिकेट दैम टू योर रेलिवेंट फ्रेटर्निटी इन ए ड्यूएबल फॉर्म to to inspire them you inspire them motivate them no why do you, why don't you think of this you think of this channel here you find this supersymmetric particles or at least one or two supersymmetric particles is coming out in this process and it is like this you see you have to give further guidelines to them then gradually if you write a couple of good papers in this direction people will take you seriously i i i would i would encourage you to go on this path Okay. Yes. Yes. Any 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 questions, please. Okay. Uh, thank. Uh, thank. Thank you, sir. Uh, anybody else having any query questions? I guess uh, no questions now. Okay. So once again, uh, thank you very much on behalf of uh, HRDC team, uh, Ayu Nenital. Okay. So it was a very mesmerizing session and very informative, and uh, it is a more uh, very significant because uh, you talked uh, talk without joke, right? <laughs> That is much value added. Uh, Bishu ji, I am so I am equally I am equally grateful to you and to your team to your organizers. for having given me this opportunity to be able to talk to you i feel honored and humbled with your kind offer and i thank all my audience who have been hearing me with a lot of patience and without without them you see you cannot keep going so the enthusiasm of your audience i admire i admire also the no i also admire no, i also admire the enthusiasm of the, the faculty of nainital mm, i consider it as my thank own you, pleasure thank you very much sir thank you thank, thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you very much thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you too thank you too thank you so much sir thank you sir thank you thank you thank you sir thank you all so much thank you all so much lots of love lots of thanks lots of best wishes to all of you Uh, I am very happy very to be with you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, professor. Okay, okay, okay. Bye, 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 bye. But, bye. but, 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 bye. I, I might remind that even though I told it yesterday, that I have a uh, YouTube channel with my name, uh, Daya Sankar Kulsreesta. You can, if you write my name in Google, you will hit upon my YouTube channel, and it is possible that even this talk gets uploaded on that, on that. channel in some due course of time and my my email happens to be just dayasankar.kulsreshta@gmail.com everything in small letters so i welcome you all to be in touch with me okay all the best bye bye thank you sir thank you very much